So I just want to introduce our speaker today. And, and I've had some time with her, just 10 minutes, and she's lovely. <laughs> she's the Reverend Maggie Dieter, and she's a United Church minister, and she's serving in New Hamburg, uh, Ontario. But she is from um, the Treaty 4 territory of the Pekasists, which means hawk. First Nations from Saskatchewan, and she served out in the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation territory. And um, Reverend Maggie has also worked as the United Church Council uh, for the General Council as Just Ministries, sorry, Executive Minister for Indigenous Ministries and Justice. And she's a, like me, a mom and a grandmother. And she, unlike me and many of us here in the room, She's an intergenerational survivor of the Indian residential school system. So I just want to welcome you today. Thank you so much for coming. I know that you have a busy schedule and I um, will give you a five minute warning at the end and uh, I'll take it away, Reverend Dieter. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you for that introduction. I think we have 75 minutes in total. Is that correct? Yes. So. Yes, it, it's good to uh, to see everyone and uh, to connect with this community. So thank you for the for the invitation, the introduction, and thank you for um, thank you participants for giving up time your Saturday, your precious Saturday, to engage in in this conversation. An invitation to be part of remaking settler Indigenous relations. It's a uh, theme uh, when presented to me I was uh, fascinated with and it and uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about how it resonated with some of the work that I had been involved in so am I speaking at an okay level everyone can hear me okay okay so uh, so, so let's just kind of get right into it so uh, Elizabeth pointed out that um, I'm hoping that we can have engagement at the end of each uh, section of, of this workshop. So I want to share some insights, some information with you, and then I wanna to pause to check in. How are you doing? What, what, what's emerging? What are the, the thoughts, uh, um, responses, ideas? And, and uh, I have a couple of questions too. So, so we're gonna take a good chunk of time uh, because I wanna hear from you sort of at the end of each of the um, uh, sessions. So I have four sessions. And, uh, but first of all, I just want to say my, my intention or my hope is, uh, in our time together, we're going to um, uh, encourage meaningful and purposeful dialogue with respect to Indigenous settler relations, and, um, and reflect on how we can uh, deepen our work towards building respect, um, uh, relationships of mutuality and respect. And uh, we want to, uh, 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 the intention is to empower awareness and sensitivity regarding indigenous peoples, uh, worldviews, cultures, and all of that. So sort of build that awareness, build some sensitivities and provide information about uh, some of the contemporary issues facing indigenous people in Canada. And I also want to recognize that um, and, and talk about how colonization not only affects, affects Indigenous people in Canada, but affects settler people as well. And finally, of course, to promote truth and reconciliation, uh, the, their final report and other initiatives that help to build uh, and to, to remake and to remember or, uh, um, the relationship that Canada has with Indigenous people. So I'm going to say a quick prayer for technology because I want, I would like to share my screen. So uh, blessings on this technology and I'm going to, I hope, share my screen. Share a screen. And I have a little PowerPoint that I want to refer to from time to time. So share. And uh, I think you can see my screen. Yes. I hope. And um, I'm wondering if uh, folks, can you see little pictures of some of us on the sidebar? Or are you just seeing my, my image? Hopefully, I, I think there's a setting. Um, Elizabeth, can you just remind us what that sure. setting is? If the sidebar of people on the side, not only the image, but people, because I'd like to keep this on sure. for a bit. 
Yeah. Sure, Reverend Maggie. It's going to be different on other on different people's devices, but if you go to the little, um, there's a, it looks like a tic-tac-toe square with the word view beside it. You click on that and, and what you can do is go side by side gallery and the icon will look different depending on your advice. But if you click on that, you'll at least see, you know, four or five people along the side and that way, um, if someone's speaking, like immediately brings me below our presenter who is uh, the Reverend Maggie. So if you can go up or down, some of them are down to that tic-tac-toe icon and click side-by-side -side gallery view, that would be great. If you have trouble, you can chat with me as well and I'll do my best. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay. So there you see an image there of um, some teepees and some beautiful land. That's Treaty, Treaty 4 territory, land of my, my homeland, I call it, in Saskatchewan. So um, uh, many times uh, when we gather uh, in, in various settings in, in the recent decade or so, we have acknowledged land, uh, land the land in which we, do, we dwell. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, where I am situated right now. I'm a visitor. On, in the territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee and Mississauga people. So I'm, I'm in a, um, an area that was um, held with importance, the dish with one spoon covenant. Um, so I wish to acknowledge that. And, and if you would like to acknowledge uh, the land as, as, as I'm sort of introducing a little bit more, please feel free to acknowledge uh, the, your, the space that you, uh, uh, that you are on in this time. So uh, I want to begin by saying that we're in a time in Canada's history where there's an abundance of opportunities to learn about Indigenous history and, and current context. And, the, and there's a myriad of um, initiatives accessible to most Canadians, if not all Canadians, uh, that invite invitation to reshape Canada's relationship with Indigenous people. So I recognize that some of us today in this conversation come from different entry points. Some of us have been around this conversation for a while. Others are fairly new to the experience. So for the purpose of this conversation, it matters not where we are on the journey, as I uh, expressed in my goals. I hope that we approach this, this subject of, of Canada's settler and Indigenous relations more from a holistic <clears throat> faith perspective today. So I'll say more about what I mean by holistic faith perspective in a moment. First, I want to say a little bit more about this moment in time. There's a book uh, that was written by Professor Phyllis Tickle. It's, it's um, uh, the, the title is The Great Emergence. And it, she uses uh, an, the analogy of the 500 year rummage sale to describe how religious institutions need to change over the years. So Tickle said that historically the church needs to clean house roughly every 500 years, holding what she calls a giant rummage sale, deciding what to dispose of and what to keep. So the rummage sale then makes room for new things to emerge. So I really like that image and I believe the church and society are in dire need of a thorough cleaning of the house. So we need a, a, a ginormous, I'm going to use that word because I really like that word, <laughs> a ginormous rummage sale uh, uh, to take place now. And, and uh, I, I do see hints of that taking place. The COVID-19 uh, global impact has revealed a lot of things to us in, in society, how it disproportionately affects the poor, those people on the margins, uh, many people uh, who don't have access to running water, migrants or displaced person, they're, they're at risk, they're more at risk. So the, the pandemic has exposed the pervasive nature of, of sy systemic racism. We've heard stories from the Asian community. We've, uh, during this time, we witnessed the murder of George Floyd. That's um, during the time of this pandemic. So it's, it's as though the last two years have seen the status quo teetering, teetering on uh, uh, as new narratives begin to emerge. Narratives like every child matters. Narratives like black lives matter. 
and build back better, the uh, UN uh, phrase that comes from rebuilding after the after the pandemic. So, so these are all signs that um, capture our need for a new paradigm, uh, a real paradigm shift. So today's conversation, uh, I, I want to suggest that before we can remember and remake vibrant and just community for both Indigenous people and settler people, our engagement first must faithfully unravel, disturb, and tear down all that holds us back from what God calls community to be. So every one of us is going to bring some knowledge of the context of remaking Canada's rela uh, relationship with Indigenous people. Each one of us has no doubt heard or been exposed to in some way the word reconciliation and, and its activity in Canada. But for the purpose of today, I'm not going to use that word very much. Um, other than making reference to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You're going to hear words like unraveling, unsettling, storytelling, transformative, remaking. While the word reconciliation has become synonymous with Indigenous right relations, thanks to the Truth and Reconciliation Report, it's also garnered criticism from many Indigenous um, uh, leaders and academics. Uh, because there's a sense that the term has actually been dismissed as a sort of a romantic attempt to smooth over Indigenous settler relationship while leaving the status quo untouched. So like other words or statements we frequently use, there's concern that the word reconciliation has become automatic, that we say it without thinking deeply about what it means and what it requires of us. So I've been, I've been challenged to find new words uh, and new images as I talk about remaking settler indigenous, as, as I talk about how I engage in remaking settler indigenous relationships. So I, I want to just, just talk a little bit now just about faithful engagement and, and, and what I mean about faithful engagement. And I think of uh, uh, Paul's letter to the Roman church uh, and I'm just going to read it. Actually, you know what? I think I have a slide. Wouldn't that be lovely if I used my slides? Okay. So, I, I, so, so there it is. Um, maybe I won't read it. Maybe I'll just pause for a moment, take a sip of my coffee. It is Saturday morning. And, and let's just take a look at this reading for a bit. I'm going to take down the uh, slide for now, I hope. Oh, maybe I can't. I don't know. Okay, so, so, so Paul is calling the church here not to conform to ways of the world, but instead to be transformed by new understandings and renewal. He reminds people that no one's higher, no one's lower, that we're all part of the whole. One body with many members and each member having a specific purpose or function. So as, as an Indigenous disciple, my years pick up on this, uh, it, it, it engages me. Uh, there's a sense of a holistic nature in, in Paul's call to the church for a faithful engagement. Uh, there's a call for offering ourselves fully, wholly to God in service. So uh, yeah, there's a wonderful, wonderful mix of words, uh, action words, uh, offer our bodies, uh, do not conform function. I mean, it's just full of action words, uh, as well as words about how we be as we're doing God's work. So another, um, another image that's important to me as an Indigenous disciple of Christ is uh, from my culture. And uh, that is uh, the medicine wheel. So uh, we're going to be, I'm inviting a journey around this medicine wheel today. Uh, I, I've used, a, I've, I've often return, uh, uh, used a book entitled The Sacred Tree. I've used it so much it's falling apart. 
and it's a dearly beloved book. Um, it's from Four Winds Development. Uh, I can give Elizabeth the information if you want uh, to, uh, some information about that at the end. Uh, but they describe the sacred, uh, it, the medicine wheel as an ancient a symbol used by um, many Native people in South, uh, North and South America. So there's, there are many different ways to explain the medicine wheel, but it, it, it expresses um, the four grandfathers, four winds, four color directions, uh, four cardinal directions, and, and other relationships that can be in, expressed in sets of four. I'm going to show you a, um, another uh, image in a moment. But I appreciate the medicine wheel in, in as much as I appreciate Paul's letter is that it really calls for an engagement of our whole self, mind, body, spirit, and emotion. And that's the journey that we're going to have today together. That's the journey that I invite us to, to, to offer fully our, our whole selves uh, to this work. So, so here we, I have an image of the seasons uh, that uh, is, is part of the a medicine wheel. So, so if we look, um, I don't know if you can see um, the whole piece, I hope you can, uh, but there's the, there's the medicine wheel sort of in, in images of, of spring, summer, winter, fall. Some of the um, characteristics of those directions, we start in the east, the yellow, we're infant and childhood, then we move over to youth and into adulthood and then elderhood. And there, there, there are specific um, gifts and responsibilities as well in, in the medicine wheel that help, uh, help our human development uh, and ed educate us and prepare us for, for life's journey. So, um, so, so we've already we've already entered into the yellow direction. We we're, we're, we've gathered. Um, here, um, a place of new beginnings together as a community, seeking to uh, remake and remember uh, settler Indigenous relation. Um, and uh, so, so, so we're here. We've arrived. We're we're in the in the conversation together. And uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna pause there, and I'm going to just ask. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I haven't been looking at the chat. Is has any questions, any thoughts, any anything emerged so far? Nothing yet, um, Reverend yeah. Dieter. Uh, could you maybe uh, stop sharing your screen so we can see everyone in case people are putting up their sure. hands? <laughs> yes, I would like to do that. Um, and for some reason, my cursor is not cooperating. Um, like, okay, well that's fine. Oh, oh. Stop sharing. Okay. There you go. Well done. <laughs> so you can use the, the hand function um, in the chat or, or, you know, it's, it's in the more for me, those, those hand, you know, put up your hand, that kind of thing, or you can use reactions depending on your settings, or you can just put your hand up now. <laughs> Any comments so far? I've, I've put the Four Winds book link in. Um, is it the Sacred Tree? Rather? Yes. Yes. Okay, I've done the wrong one. Yes. Thanks. And, uh, yeah, I can. Jean, say did you find it? Anyways, let me send you the information at the end, and yeah, we'll, I will. I will send, save it and send it to. To the uh, to the participants, that would be great. Sure. I will. Yeah. Well, if if so, so we've sort of just uh, um, set the table, and uh, I, I guess maybe we can proceed if there isn't any sort of comments or, or thoughts right now. Um, just want to. Uh, I do need to share. Do need to share my slide again for uh, for this next section. So um, just bear with me please. Um, Perfect, you got it. Okay. Okay, so we are in, um, we're going to move then uh, into the, the southern direction, uh, a place where we prepare for the future. And it's a place of heart. It's a place of youth. 
Um, so it makes sense that it's a place of emotion and passion. So I want to tell you a little bit about my story. I, I served at the United Church uh, General Council Office for close to 10 years as executive minister for Indigenous Ministries and Justice. And uh, I, I served at a time when, the, when Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission came about. Uh, so to say the least, uh, my time in service there was, was um, intense. It was e emotionally charged um, uh, in the experience of listening to and hearing stories of, of past students in the, in the, uh, of the Indian Residential School. So um, even though myself being a, being a residential school intergenerational survivor, it was a very intense experience um, to, um, to sort of begin to, um, um, uh, to, to reveal, for the, for the story to be revealed in a more sort of um, a larger societal uh, level. So I, I recall how Commissioner Marie Wilson would often remind Canadians that emotions will be felt as the truth of Canada's history is being revealed. She advised people, feel the feelings. She said, let, let, allow yourself to feel the feelings. Allow the feelings of anger, sadness, guilt, shame, allow them to be. And she encouraged people to, to, to allow them to, to teach you something. What, what are they trying to, to, to tell you, to, um, uh, to inform you? So, so I was always grateful for uh, Marie Wilson's invitation to self-inquiry and that it is, a, is, it is an essential a part of truth-telling. Uh, if truth-telling is to be at all in, uh, transformational for, for all Canadians. So the, another commissioner, uh, Marie Sinclair, who was chair of the TRC, would remind the Canadians that the issues that led us to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission was not that it was an Indian problem, quote unquote, Indian problem, but that the issues, the problems belong to every Canadian. It's a Canadian problem. There's a quote that's attributed to uh, Lila Watson. She's an Indigenous artist and writer from Australia. You may have heard it. If you come here to help me, you're wasting your time. If you came because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. So Dr. Watson names the need to check our colonialistic perceptions and our attitudes uh, in the task of, of remaking colonial or in the, uh, in the in the midst of remaking settler indigenous relationships. So again to, to decolonize is to unravel, to tear down these existing practices that continue to diminish relationships of mutuality and respect. So as I said, I'm, a, I'm an intergenerational survivor. This means that my parents, my grandparents attended the Indian residential school system. My mother was Anglican and my father United Church. It's not clear to me how my mother managed not to be in residential school because her older siblings went and her younger siblings uh, were part of the day school system. But my father attended residential school. Uh, File Hills Residential School, a United Church run uh, school in the Treaty 4 area. And my grandparents, his parents, attended the precursor to, to residential school, which was uh, the Regina Industrial School. And this is where they learned about farming and other and, and the domestic way of life. So uh, my grandparents' marriage was arranged by the colonial system of the day likely the Indian agent. Um, and, and as this was happening, if you can imagine my grandparents, uh, to my grandparents, their cohorts, like their, their neighbors, their um, uh, relatives, many of them still lived the, the nomadic lifestyle on the prairie. So we're talking, you know, the Saskatchewan and, and the prairie area. 
they would have been still hunting and fishing and, and living that type of a life and having, you know, uh, although that type of life was coming to an end on the plains because of the influx of settlers who needed land. So upon graduation, my grandparents were settled on a plot of land known as the File Hills Co Colony and instructed to farm. So I, I'm not going to get into the story of my parents and my grandparents' lives. Um, I And I'm not going to speak directly today to the impact of what the residential school system has had on my family. I will say that it that its legacy is complex and layered and continues to have an impact on, on my family in, in many ways, as well as my community and, uh, and, my rel and many relatives. So Prime Minister Trudeau, when the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Report was released, he, he said this, Indian, the Indian res residential school system is one of the darkest chapters in Canadian history and has had a profoundly lasting and damaging impact on Indigenous culture, heritage, and language. So I, while I agree with what the Prime Minister said, I would add that the Indian residential school system resulted uh, in intergenerational uh, trauma that impacts Indigenous families and communities emotionally, physically, uh, mentally, and spiritually to this day. So while speaking truth to this dark chapter of our, of our history here in Canada is a pathway to healing and liberation for Indigenous people, it's important for Canadians to understand that there is a cost to survivors and intergenerational survivors. The stories are often, often carry themes of loneliness, neglect, and, and uh, racism. So, so as we stand together, virtually in this in this southern uh, direction. Um, a place of heart, um, seeking to have uh, our faith ground us as we approach to approach the remaking or the tearing apart, then the remaking of indigenous settler relations. Uh, the invitation is to ground ourselves in compassion and understanding compassion and understanding for ourselves for for what we feel what we experience as well as for one another because we need we need that ginormous garage sale or or rummage sale and that's kind of scary because we need to discard na narratives we need to discard systems uh and all all of the assumptions that um have deep history in our country and remain deeply ingrained in our systems and institutions and churches included. So here's an example of, of what needs to be put out, uh, a part of that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if we'd really want to rummage sale this. I think it just needs to be uh, totally uh, discarded and um, unraveled because a, a quote that I'm going to share with you comes from Duncan Campbell Scott. He was he was uh, responsible for running the residential school system when it was at its peak. Uh, he was a civil servant with uh, in, in Aboriginal affairs, probably called Indian affairs at the time. And he said this, uh, his, 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 this he spoke of, of his mandate. When he mandated IR, of the Indian residential school uh, he mandated Indian residential school attendance in 1920. That was the year my father was born. He stated, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. I do not think as a matter of a fact that the country ought to be continuously, uh, ought to continuously protect a class of people who are able to stand alone. Our objective is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic and there is no Indian question, no Indian department. That is the whole object of this bill. And so that was uh, Duncan Campbell Scott's um, mandate uh, and uh, focus for Indigenous people. I kind of need to take a deep breath after I 
I, th I, I read that quote. So, so this narrative, even though from 1920, it's still ingrained in Canadian systems and it needs dismantling. So to this end, there, there have been initiatives and uh, that have begun to unsettle this legacy of colonialism. Uh, you might remember back in 1991 and that um, there was a Royal Commission on Aboriginal peoples that emerged out of the Oka crisis. Excellent report came through extensive research and consultation with communities. Um, it talked about historical realities, contemporary relations with Indigenous peoples. And, and the report made a lot of recommendations, good recommendations, but the majority today remain unfulfilled. They've never been implemented. And yet this is, this is still a very important and very relevant document. And then some time later, we have the Truth and Reconciliation Report, which I already mentioned, 94 calls to action to redress the legacy of residential school. And then the report from the Murdered and Missing Indigenous, uh, murdered and missing indigenous Women and Girls um, issue. Uh, that report speaks to the persistent and deliberate human and indigenous rights violations and abuses uh, that are, you know, at staggering rates in Canada here. A lot of violence and I can, I, I have cohorts of um, um, uh, schoolmates uh, that have gone uh, missing uh, over the years. And, and this issue goes back to the 1970s. I mean, before that, but in my memory, I was aware of murdered and missing Indigenous women in the 1970s in my high school years, uh, because some of my schoolmates, um, too, had uh, gone missing about 1974 and 1975. So, uh, it, it, so it, 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 it's as though these initiatives, the, the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women Report, the, the TRC, the, the Royal Commission, uh, it's, it's as though these very significant reports have had a way for Canadians to incrementally reveal the truth of our history. Perhaps it would have been too much. I mean, we, you know, we can only sort of absorb so much um, at one time. So, so maybe it was a way of, of, of incrementally unraveling the truth of our history, our shared history. It's a painful history, not only for Indigenous people, but for us settlers as well. And, and I would argue that we are still living this history. It's not over. We, we still live in, in colonialism. So, so let's pause here. I'm going to stop sharing, I hope. Um, oh, I know what I have to do now. I've learned the trick. <laughs> Bravo, <laughs> it's such a challenge. Well done. <laughs> so um, how, how, how are you uh, in, in this imagining, in this thinking about unraveling? So we have to sort of unravel, unsettle before we remember, remember, and remake. So, so notice I'm not asking what you're going to do about it. I'm asking, how are you? I'm asking you, where's your hope? And, and where's your sorrow? So if you wanna just take a moment to think about that and, and start typing in the chat, maybe we can have a few conversations before we have time. I think Reverend Maggie, yes. um, one of our participants, Jean, has asked if you would like to share the names of the two people that went missing to offer up. Um, I, I would. Um, well, no, I don't think I will. I would. Um, uh, but they they were two women from, from my community on um, on the Fall Hills, Bipikisi's First Nation. And uh, one of or two of of hundreds and hundreds of young women who have gone missing and and, and just want to be uh, sensitive to 
to family and to circumstances. So uh, I appreciate the question, but I, I think we, I would, because I understand this is being recorded and will later yes. be, be um, uh, aired. So just that sensitivity, but thank you. Somebody has their hand raised. Yes, it's Mary. Mary, would you unmute and ask your question? Yeah, I just wanted to say um, our church recently um, read the book Highway of Tears. And um, that's that's a very, very sad book, but it's it's a great it's a great read. Um, it's a true story about the murdered and missing Indigenous women and uh, children. And uh, it was a lot of information in that book. I don't know if you've read it, uh, Reverend Maggie or or not, but it's it's a very good, good book. Yes. And it helps you understand uh, everything about what what went on for these women and, and girls. And it, it's just very sorrowful. And my hope is that, uh, you know, somehow, some some way that, uh, you know, things get better for Indigenous women and, and girls. Did you, would you like to sh uh, share, Mary, a little bit about where, where, where's your hope? Where's your, uh, you named your sorrow. You yeah, I think, I think the sadness was like this, this highway of tears is a highway in for those who don't know, it's a highway in, in British Columbia. Um, highway 16 is what it is from Prince Rupert to Prince George. And this is where most of the women uh, were murdered or went missing. And I mean, my hope that is that, you know, the, the RCMP didn't do the, the girls justice at all uh, of how they, they um, you know, uh, investigated or, or non-investigated non uh, when when they went missing and and uh, they didn't react fast enough because you know quote they they just thought these were indigenous women and girls and like nobody cared and so my hope is that uh, certainly that somebody you know takes <laughs> is aware of what's going on and uh, you know does something about it because it was certainly a sad a sad read but it was a very good read it helped me understand and I mean, it helped me sign up for this for this workshop because I, I was very interested to see what you had to say. Mm -hmm. So the murdered and missing Indigenous, uh, um, well, the inquiry uh, has a report and that might be a really helpful, good next step in um, deepening uh, deepening engagement in the issue of violence against Indigenous women in Canada. Uh, there, it sort of gets at what is underneath, uh, you know, that um, that iceberg uh, in terms of uh, the issue and uh, some actions that are needed. Because as I say, they're, they're systemic um, and, and they belong to all of Canada. Uh, it's a Canadian issue, a Canadian concern. And so we as Canadians, um, and, and we as disciples are, 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 uh, are called, you know, through our faith and the TRC calls us through um, their report to, to, to engage. Um, so I think that I would, I would highly recommend that report as, as a next step. So thanks for sharing, Mary. Maggie, uh, we have a question from Michael Van Dusen about um, the Indian agent comment that you made. Michael, would you unmute and ask, ask Reverend Maggie? So, yes, uh, thank you for the, the conversation. This is almost a footnote, but I found it quite shocking that you said that your parents, uh, your grandparents um, were put together in an arranged marriage by the Indian agent. And uh, is, did I hear that correctly first? That that is uh, a part of the history. Yes, that uh, uh, so my grandparents would have been sort of literally plucked from the land uh, because they, as children, taken to the industrial school to learn ways of farming, to learn ways of domestic care of the home, uh, and they were not domesticated people. They they were nomadic. They hunted, fished. They had their own governance. They had their so so. This was a total sort of. Um, at the beginning of uh, sort of tearing apart, you know, there's a, their way of being, and with the with the imposition of the Indian Act and the the policy that still exists today, uh, government government uh, governments were had the um, the power to uh, literally control the lives of of my um, grandparents. Um, 
they, they couldn't they couldn't sell a pig unless they had a written consent from the um, Indian agent who was representing the the, the government and uh, the administrator of the area. So overseeing uh, Indigenous peoples in, in, in a specific region, they couldn't leave the reserve without a pass. So that and that I, you can Google that to see when that uh, that that was part, that part of the Indian Act was um, um, torn apart. Uh, what, am, what am I calling it? I'm calling it unraveling. You know, so, you know the, the, that was eventually pulled. But um, there was a time not so long ago when Indigenous people needed permission to leave the reserve, permission to sell their cows. Yeah, I, I, it, it was the it was the power to arrange marriages mm -hmm. that um, it, uh, the, uh, that I found particularly shocking. Yeah. Uh, was that in your understanding, is that something that was very common? I, I couldn't say how common that that was. Um, it, I can't say how common that was, but but if we think of it in terms of the bigger picture, they had the power to remove children from the parents. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was a it was a lot of uh, of imposition of of power. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, we've had a couple of comments in the chat, and then I'll ask Michelle to unmute herself to ask a question. Um, Genesis was talking about uh, the need for us to support the land back movement. And I'm grateful for that. I'm also, um, Ann Creighton was saying, you know, it's going to be, you know, the, the police and the RCMP in particular have never, you know, the truth has never been fully investigated about their role and their lack of action and, and their, their role in that. Michelle, would you um, unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Hello, Reverend Maggie. I am a... Uh grateful to be living uh, in um, the uh, Mississaugas Anishinaabe territory in uh, what's now Toronto. Um, and I uh, am mother of a status Indian from uh, North Shore of Lake Huron. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I'd like you to um, speak in a general way to um, intergenerational trauma um, and how it um, is um, for so many families as a, as a teacher and um, a city dweller and very much a middle class um, uh, immigrant to Canada. Um, it is a, it has been tremendously deeply affecting um, that intergenerational trauma is not uh only apparent uh in on reserve and in uh on reserves on first nations in uh far off places that we can separate ourselves from but um in hidden in plain sight uh in um, well-off neighborhoods, and it, it's not an economic issue. It's a, it's a, an issue of identity and of what our colonial uh, structure has um, has done to Indigenous people in Canada. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I appreciate your comments, uh, Michelle. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so intergenerational is, uh, trauma is um, is pervasive throughout Indigenous uh, communities, um, and it's it's uh, it, it's an experience of um, 
it, it's trauma being transmitted from generation to generation, unresolved trauma uh, uh, that uh, gets passed from generation to generation. Um, an example uh, of this, which um, I'm going to speak to a little bit more later on, but um, you know, listening to the news uh, early in the spring as the graves were being um, on, uh, as, the, as, the, as the existence of the of the graves were being uh, shared broadly uh, to Canadians, it, it triggered uh, most. Uh, Indigenous people, um, the trauma, the the, the convert. Even though, for many of us, myself, knowing of those grave sites since I was a child, um, the, the the revelation for the rest of Canada was traumatizing to me. Um, uh, it, it was shocking, uh, and and I was very disturbed by Canadians shocked response because you know we've had the TRC there are as I indicated earlier so many opportunities for Canadians to learn the history and it's still not known it's buried like the children and um, like the children were buried unmarked and forgotten or or or, or so so we thought, but they're not. Um, and so and so that unresolved a pain, that unresolved um, wrongdoing uh, gets carried forward uh, in in from generation to generation. And, and I want to even push that a little bit farther is that unresolved wrongdoing, um, harm impacts each and every Canadian. It's part of our DNA. And whether or not we're aware of it, mm -hmm. it's affecting our relationships. It, it's affecting our ability to, uh, to strengthen our country, uh, to work together in our communities, in our churches. Uh, it's part of the DNA. The pain is in the ground. Uh, we've tried, we've tried to bury it, we've tried to hide it. But these powerful stories cannot be, um, cannot be hidden forever. And so yes, there is inter intergenerational trauma. Uh, there is a lot of work to do on every front. If you are watching the news last night, you would have heard that the Canadian government has decided not to appeal the court case that's been in for 14 years, Canada has been ordered to compensate those children who have been in the uh, child welfare system and not cared for, have been neglected. Um, and and the, our systems have allowed that. So there was a tribunal that said Canada needs to correct this. 14 years, Canada has fought. And, and I say, in, in fact, they're fighting, they're still fighting the indigenous children. Our federal government. Just take a listen to Cindy Blackstock. Yeah. <laughs> so now the Canadian government says, no, we're not going to appeal. We'll negotiate. Well, I hope, my hope is they, they, they negotiate, um, uh, you know, n now today, like to, to, to stop, to stop the, the wrongdoing the pain, the suffering, to resolve it, to bring it to a close, and to, to, to open a new chapter uh, for Canadian uh, relationships in terms of uh, child welfare for Indigenous children. So, so, so sorry. Thank you, Reverend Maggie. We've got about 20 minutes left, and I know there are a couple more oh. questions. Do you want to move on, or are you able to take um, these can we can we take a look at just a couple of the comments in the chat just before we move ahead? I just just like to acknowledge. Um, just some people are saying, sadly, the government has not addressed the role of the police. Yes, absolutely, and it really it it, it continues to go back to that systemic um, uh, reality the reality that the um, uh, the pain the. Um, uh, the wrongdoing is is just you know sort it's sort of woven right into our systems. Um, 
Yes. So, I mean, we can move along. How, how much time do we have? Just About 20 minutes, oh, uh, Reverend 20. Maggie. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to share the screen again. Thank you, everyone, for that uh, conversation. I uh, it's my favorite part. Um, I'm going to share the screen. Okay, and okay. So here we are. We are leaving the southern direction. We've been here a while, that, that, that place of youth and, and heart, moving to the uh, western direction. And uh, it, the western direction is a place of, of darkness. Uh, it's a time for introspection. Um, and, and we've been in it. In, in this conversation, we, we've sort of moved into that. So, so now it's time to take up the challenge and it's time to stick with the challenge. Um, there, there's, there, fr from the Western direction also comes lightning, thunder. And so just imagine the power in that lightning and thunder. So there's capacity for us in this direction to take up the challenge, okay? So I hope, I hope, so there we are, Western direction. And I, this, that's what I hope for. I wanted to show us a mountain because that's what Justice Maurice Sinclair talked about uh, at the release of the TRC report. He said, achieving reconciliation is like climbing a mountain. We must proceed a step at a time. It will not always be easy. There will be storms, there will be obstacles, but we cannot allow ourselves to be daunted by the task because our goal is just and it is also necessary. So we talked about the, the revelation of the graves that sites that are scattered across Canada. And I haven't been keeping up with the number that are um, being discovered. And I'm doing that intentionally. Um, I, 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 at this time, while uh, First Nations are working, uh, while First Nations are, are grieving and coming to terms, I, I don't need, to, I don't want to know the count right now. Um, I need to engage in, in a different way. Um, it's, it's heart rendering, uh, it's heartbreaking to, to hear the stories over and over again. Uh, just to say that my own father's brother died of neglect in, in the residential school. So we really don't know why, um, how he died, only that he was sent to the, um, uh, you know, the sick room uh, at, one, at one time and then his older brothers never seen him after that. So, um, so I don't know how many we, we have. Maybe you know, but, but at this point in time, I'm, I'm, I'm holding communities in prayer and that's what I can do. Uh, and so, but, but um, back, so, so that was May 27, 2021 that we heard from the, the BC First Nation and then June 2021 that we heard from Kaos's First Nation. So we were in the middle of a shutdown too here in Ontario because of the pandemic. So very isolating time in our history to be hearing this news. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to uh, quote what Chief uh, Cadmus Delorme said um, about uh, the site. He said, removing headstones is a crime in this country. So we're treating this uh, uh, crime, this scene as a, as a crime scene in this moment. And, and I was very, uh, I, I, I think that Cadmus was, was um, courageous and, and, and uh, truth-telling in, in what he said. And uh, I, I, I truly appreciated it. And he wasn't alone in, in his description of a crime scene uh, when it came to, uh, when it comes to describing the Indian residential school system. Um, because, um, uh, you may or may not know about this Canadian doctor, uh, about 100 years ago or so, he, uh, he sounded the alarm for the residential school system, uh, but he was silenced by the government. Now, Cindy Blackstock will talk about him. His name was uh, Dr. Peter Bryce, 
Uh, he repeatedly warned his superiors at the Department of Indian Affairs uh, of the rampant spread of tuberculosis that was happening in the schools and, that, and how it was killing Indigenous children. Uh, he spent months examining particularly uh, schools in Saskatchewan, some in Manitoba and Alberta, finding very unsanitary conditions, poor health practices, buildings that were prone to fires that didn't have any ventilation. Um, so Dr. Bryce wrote to his bosses and he wrote this, it's almost as if the prime conditions of the outbreak of epidemics have been deliberately created. So John Malloy, an author, uh, he wrote a book uh, entitled National Crime. You want to get that title, Nas uh, uh, National Crime, John Malloy. It's where he refers to uh, the words used by Dr. Bryce in, in 1922. Um, uh, so he publicly um, spoke about the, the neglect um, in, in, the, in the schools. Uh, so, so after this, he, um, he and he pleaded for reform publicly. He pleaded for reform, but after after that, uh, Malloy just characterizes uh, uh, Bryce as being a whistleblower, um, and the department shunned all of his his findings. Uh, he was uh, Dr. Bryce was then shunned from blocked from any academic conferences or or anything of that sort. So, Dr. Bryce. <laughs> He, he sounded the alarm 100 years ago, but was silenced. So at the time of the discovery of the graveyards of children in BC and of cows, there, there, was a, there was a great public outcry. And I talked about how I was troubled by that because I know there has been opportunity for Canadians to learn and to respond and to act. So um, we talk about intergenerational violence. I think that was a bit of a trigger for me thinking, well, we know we have access, we have resources in this country, and uh, we, we need to start utilizing them. We need, we need to educate um, all through the ages. Um, but yet, you know, we continue to be startled, and, and, and it's okay to be startled. And going back to what Marie Wilson said, we have to acknowledge our feelings, the heartbreak, and, and the anger, and, and, and sometimes the guilt. Um, but we can't stop there. We, we, we allow our feelings to teach us and, and, and move us. What is that anger saying that we need to do? Uh, remember, and, and, and go, sort of going back to Paul's words to the Roman church, remember, you know, we, we have something to offer. We are the body of Christ. We have something to offer. Um, so uh, I think the question right now for us in the time that we have left together is, is um, are we up for the challenge? How do we feel about beginning to unravel this, the oppressive and current state of these colonialistic perceptions and systems uh, that, that are put on Canada's Indigenous people? What do we do as, as citizens? What do we do as people of faith? Are we up for a challenge to, to unravel, to unsettle, to remember and remake? We have apologies, our denominations, both our denominations have powerful words of apology and recognition. We have calls to action. We have a pathway to the mountain. Thank you to the commissioners of the TRC. So are we up for the challenge? So here, here's a question. I can type it in the chat if you like. How, how might what you've heard today impact future dialogues, future actions uh, toward faith-filled engagement uh, that it, with respect to remembering and, and remaking Indigenous settler relations? So, I want to hear from you. What might, what, what, how might you act differently? How might you be uh, different as you approach um, the work of remaking and rebuilding?
You want to stop sharing, please, Reverend Maggie? Thank you. Sorry. And we've no, got a no, I, I, got to... I don't apologize. I, 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 I need the reminders. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's wonderful. We've had Genesis waiting for a while. Genesis, if you could um, unmute, please, and then Cheryl. Hi, Reverend Maggie. Thank you so much for sharing your presence, your words, uh, your knowledge. Um, you know, you are a gift. Thank you so much for what you've brought. Uh, I feel emboldened uh, to continue as a settler of color, work towards indigenous solidarity, um, educating my people on their role in how they are invested in the settler colonial project themselves. And, um, you know, also the ways our respective histories of colonization may indeed uh, through our understanding of each other outside of the lens of white supremacy, we might be able to dialogue and find intersections of liberative practices. And um, I have a dear friend of mine uh, who is Ojibwe from uh, up north near Sudbury area. And recently together, because of a... Um, a workshop where uh, a powerful knowledge keeper, a Mohawk woman was sharing her story and practice about land back, both of us began a journey of connecting with the land and, and what that meant. And I didn't know how deeply I myself felt the wound of being disconnected, not only from this land, um, but the, my motherland as well. Um, and so, you know, both of us have been on this respective healing journey and recently speaking with my, my, my therapist, I realized this and, and hope to share this. One of the biggest things that came through my understanding of being in, you know, solidarity and relationship with my friend was we have to share power. Mm -hmm. And it is my responsibility to acknowledge my power and and, and how I can redistribute my resources and my even limited capacity, right? Uh, so that they can thrive on this land that is rightfully their, theirs to thrive on. So I just wanna say thank you so much. And if you could speak um, to, you know, um, the particular complexities of, uh, you know, um, communities of color uh, as it comes to, you know, indigenous solidarity and centering indigenous led projects like Land Back, because, you know, I know that there's been a long history of black and indigenous solidarity. Um, and, you know, there is some history of, you know, uh, South Asian communities coming into the conversation. But, uh, you know, we, we all hold very different uh, locations social locations and, and power um, and investment in that power in white supremacy. So I, I would really appreciate your words and your thoughts in this manner. Thank you. Before you answer, um, Reverend Maggie, um, we've had a, an ask, can you please explain what land back movement is? Yes. Um, from what I understand, there are initiatives uh, look, that look at um, reclaiming uh, land. Is, are, is there a specific initiative that you have been looking um, or, or, or seeking engagement in, Genesis? Uh, I mean, there are many uh, ways uh, that land back initiatives, I think, are um, emerging. I think one of the biggest lessons for me engaging in dialogue with great organizers in, I'm, uh, uh, I'm right now located in Toronto, um, uh, Nanook and Bree of Native Arts Society and uh, Indigenous Harm Reduction. They're doing some of uh, the most, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, really unraveling groundbreaking okay. work. 
Um, and uh, engaging, me and my friend have been engaging with them and going to their protests and healing circles. Yeah. And one of the biggest thing that I've learned is that land back is really not just about uh, our colonial conception of land. Literally, the land is something that is living and breathing and our it has a relationship to each and every one of us. And that includes like a full bodily remembering yes. of our relationship to it and each other and our and as stewards. So that's my understanding of it, that it's not just land is centered because, you know, it's praxis, but it's definitely like, like you were saying, the it's a colonial world building. They created a world in their image and it's time for us to unravel that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, so just just to say a bit about um, you know initiatives around land. I mean, it, it's 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 about relationship with the land, and and under you know coming into relationship respectful again and mutual relationship because because th there's mutuality with land. It's just not a sort of a one one-way relationship and so it's restoring remembering and rebuilding that relationship and and, and just in terms of, i mean there's a lot to say about that but i think um importantly it's 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 right it's appropriate to engage locally and to keep those and, and to start those conversations locally with um uh with indigenous peoples or um yeah and 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 i mean i think uh you, you speak about the the diversity in in the various uh, ethnic communities. I think it's really exciting and important to to begin those conversations. I mean, again, you know that that they all there there are varying levels of entry into the conversation. I've been I was part of some in northern Manitoba at a healing lodge a couple of years ago uh, during the, the TRC, and it was just amazing insights. What we learn from one another, newcomers, elders, giving placing dirt of the earth into newcomers land, uh, hands and saying welcome you're part of this land now you have responsibility you know and and so so those you know uh those are the types of meaningful in, engagements i think that we can we can share amongst one another and and, and share locally so so thanks for uh, your your reflections and the question so does do we have time i i, I want to close with just a I, I need about two minutes to close elizabeth so if you just okay let's let's just uh hear from cheryl who has had her hand up for a long time cheryl you could unmute please and ask your question and then we'll close okay uh so just watering down this to a few things um <laughs> what what we can do in the broader society and or in in church so there's to me, it's it's too big a picture. My focus is on uh, my faith community. And in the Anglican Church of Canada Indigenous uh, section, there's a marvelous toolkit. Uh, Dr. Ginny Doctor, um, Reverend Canon Ginny Doctor, who passed away in May, day before the first revelation of bodies and tecumlutes, uh, created a, a podcast of sacred teachings. So for me to be familiar with those things and then to not just think about how how bad oh something oh, i think we've lost you cheryl i am i, I will am try I still, to am well, i still go. there yeah. yeah you're back for me to to hear those things and know that it's not just indigenous trauma but it is mine it is the churches and i need to feel it for myself and acknowledge it myself that remembering is not just for indigenous people it is for me it is for us um so that's that's where i'll stop i think that's an important point we're all on the healing journey it as as commissioner wilson's um sinclair said this is not an indian problem this is a canadian problem and it's in our dna and we're living that trauma we're living that dark history and this is canada will continue to struggle with its identity until we 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 truly um, unravel and unearth uh, the truth and 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 build something new, build something that is new and and true to who we are as as a people on this land, um, on this part of Turtle Island. So I appreciate that. And yes, it can be. I mean, it's it's a big. There's a lot out there. We can't engage in it all. Uh, but I want to leave you with this that. You know, if we're going to climb a mountain, we don't want to do it alone. At least I don't. I want people who know what they're doing. I want you know people who have some experience, 
uh, have some knowledge of the land, the territory, um, you know, people that I can collaborate with. Uh, you know, we, so we, we, we need to, in, we, we don't have to reinvent things. We can engage in what's happening and engage where we have, we have an interest and a, and a, and a passion. So, so that um, something that I just want to say is taking apart colonial systems of oppression requires collaboration. It's not a, a time to have the mindset of helping the Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Indigenous people don't want your help. Indigenous people are not looking for help. The Indigenous people can are capable of caring for themselves. What in, Indigenous people are seeking is nation building, creating a new paradigm, a new paradigm for healthy, robust, creative living. That's what Indigenous people are looking for. They're not looking for a handout. They're looking for uh, nation building. So it's time to put our energy into a common purpose. So going forward, tons of things we can do initiatives there, collaboration, learn, share your learnings with your friends, your family, your, your community of faith, write your local leaders, engage with your local leaders, talk to them, uh, you know, learn about narratives of transformation, you know, have a rummage sale, you know, deal with some of those old narratives that just need to be debunked, build some new ones. There are wonderful narratives out there wonderful young people, uh, you know, engaging in wonderful ways. Uh, talk about how remaking and remembering communities requires our physical, emotional, our spiritual, mental selves, our whole selves. And we could even talk financial too, because it's kind of money talks. And if, if Canadians hear that, that remaking and rebuilding, um, has fiscal savings, we might be more prone to do it. So because because Indigenous scholars and, and leaders will say that, you know, take the child welfare system, for example, they call it an industry. Indigenous children are an industry. And uh, that needs to stop. So I'm, I, I'm going to, I could go on and, and I really appreciate this time together. And I just want to offer a, a prayer if I could, and it's in the shape, it, it's, it's in the form of a poem. I recommend this book highly, Lifting Hearts Off the Ground. It's uh, it, really what it is, is it is sections of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, followed by poetry. So I, there's another book. Okay, so let's close our time together uh, with these words that are written just right at the very front of this book to the web of life, to relatives with four legs, two legs with wings, who live in oceans, who live buried in the earth, and within that web to the human family that we might move towards reciprocal wholeness, to those who suffer as at the misguided hands of colonization, may these words help and heal. To those of us who inflict the suffering both unwittingly and knowingly, may these words enlighten, forgive and educate to the mothers who were and are targeted because they are the root of society, to the elders who spoke outside of his story before treaties were forced upon us in the terms of those who sought conquest, to those who called out from the wilderness of dehumanizing machines disguised as schools, to the warriors who never gave up and will never give up, to those who round dance on the streets, to those Indigenous peoples of Europe who were similarly destroyed and assimilated by patriarchy, fear, and other violent means, for the healing of past and present wounds, that we might all break free from the illusions of separation and hierarchy, to the children born today of every origin and background, that they may know the sacredness that created them and how sacred they are. And may it be so, friends. It was good to be with you. Thank you so much, Maggie. What a wonderful space you've created for us. May the Lord bless you in your ministry and keep our minds and hearts open and our hands and feet ready to act. Thank you so much. Amen to that. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you yeah, everyone. Well done. Everyone's saying what a great, what a great experience this has been. So thank you.